after the lecture, I will be here available with this. So thank you, sorry for. Okay, so thanks, Alvi, for that. Uh, so, uh, so let's make a start then. Uh, so, the, uh, Madam Franco is going to carry on the uh, second part: photothermal microscopy and spectroscopy. Okay, thank you very much. Um, for the beginning, we will refresh a little bit um, the material that we covered yesterday, and this was about uh, thermal lens microscopy. And I have promised to show you the last three, three slides in five minutes and uh, discuss the, the question of, let's say, expanding the applicability of thermal lens spectrometry in the sense of, um, or by enabling um, additional wavelengths for excitation. And of course, because of the limited number of la available lasers, one of the ways of doing it is, of course, using incoherent light sources such as uh, a xenon lamp, for example. And here you have a, a scheme of a thermal lens microscope, as we have seen it yesterday, but instead of using a uh, uh, laser source, we use optical fiber to bring in the entire spectrum of the, of the xenon lamp. Of course, the power uh, of such a, a lamp is relatively low. So in, in, let's say, at around 515 nanometers, which would correspond to one of the argon laser lines in a, within a one nanometer bandwidth, we can get about one milliwatt power. And uh, if you remember the enhancement factors that we spoke about, this would be less sensitive if we do measurements in water samples. This would be less, less sensitive than spectrophotometric determination. Uh, in addition, we have to take into account that in the thermal lens microscopy, we don't have one centimeter optical interaction length like in conventional spectrophotometry, but we, we reduce it by a factor of, of uh, 100 to the, to the distance of about 100 microns. So, but however, when we go from the macroscopic system to a microscopic system, we have to take into consideration some phenomena which were neglected in the case of macroscopic thermal lens. Particularly, we have neglected the uh, conduction of heat into the uh, windows of the, our uh, detection cell. Of course, when you, when you consider this uh, few microns, or maybe some 10 microns, in comparison to one centimeter, this is, of course, negligible. But when you do it in comparison to 100 micrometers, this does not become negligible anymore. And we, we can see that the temperature rise due to the photothermal heating appears also in the surrounding of our sample. Of course, this can generate thermal lens in this material, not only in our sample. So this, here we got the idea that eventually by exploiting this temperature change, we can enhance our thermal lens signal. So we have proposed, uh, let's say, a so-called three-lens system. Here is our sample generating a thermal lens, and then we have additional thermal lenses in the front and at the rear of our sample. Now, by using appropriate materials with appropriate photothermal properties, high change in the index of refraction with temperature and low thermal conductivity, we can generate thermal lenses comparable to the thermal lens that is generated in our sample. And here we have some examples for different materials. Uh, octane as a representative of organic solvents. We have seen yesterday that they have extremely high enhancement factor. And you can see that compared to the adiabatic, adiabatic means that in the vicinity, we have a signal, uh, we have a material with, the, with the, exactly the same uh, thermal properties as our sample. So in this case, we would get such a signal. If we put octane, we increase considerably our signal. Polystyrene is somewhere in between, but infused silica, we get a decrease in the signal. Why? 
somebody has listened yesterday, remembers what we discussed yesterday. Silica has a positive dN over dt, while n-octane has strongly negative dN over dt. And this is that the sign of the thermal lens signal changes. So here we have what we call a positive thermal lens signal. In the vicinity, we have a negative thermal lens signal. So we have something we don't want in this kind of system. But using organic materials, we can significantly improve the sensitivity of our system. And we have designed such a similar, uh, similar detection cell where we can control the thickness of our sample. And we have two immixable solvents, one on the bottom, one on the top. And here we have the results showing just a single layer, just a sample in this system, very flat calibration curve. When we add one layer on the, on the bottom, we already get an improvement with two layers. Uh, this is now with the, with the UV lamp excited already. And with three layers, so we have our sample and the organic solvents on the bottom, which do not mix, we get quite a strong enhancement of almost one order of magnitude. So by using um, light sources such as, uh, such as uh, xenon lamp, which has an overlap in the emission spectrum with uh, the absorption spectrum of our analyte, in this case it was iron complex, iron 2 with 110 phenantrolin or ferroin short. This is the absorption spectrum. So we were measuring uh, somewhere in this range around 510 nanometers. So uh, this is a, a suggestion for improving sensitivity in thermal lens microscopy with, when using uh, incoherent light sources or low power light sources uh, like lead emitting diodes which gives you more versatility for your applications. And uh, we were able still, you know, to, in, in a 100 micrometer cell to detect absorbances on the order of 10 to the, five, 10 to the minus 5 absorption units, which is, I believe, still better than commercial transmission mode spectrophotometers. OK. Um, with this, uh, our yesterday's lecture is over. <laughs> I would only like to point out some of the literature, which is in the PDF also, uh, I think, of all, as of half an hour ago, both of my lectures are available online to you. And you can find some uh, suggestions for readings, uh, including the Bible of Analytical Thermal Lens Spectrometry by Stephen Bielkowski, and some other references uh, which were published Recently, maybe something is still missing. No, no, th this, one, this is the last one from uh, mainly microscopic thermal lens spectrometry. And of course, if, if you have additional questions, you can ask me anytime today, till Friday, or just send an email. If you don't have questions ready today, so now uh, I would like to move on to the applications of thermal lens uh, spectrometry and microscopy. I have added here for bioimaging and particularly for bioanalysis. Bioimaging by thermal lens spectrometry is not very common, and I think only one paper appeared which can be really classified as a bioimaging, uh, microscopic uh, analysis of a single, molecule, a single uh, cell was reported. Of course, there are many, many other variations of uh, photothermal techniques that are used for imaging, detection of uh, nano objects, so labeling uh, proteins and biomolecules with, uh, with uh, nano silver, nano gold particularly can be used. And uh, you can refer to works of uh, Brahim Lunis from Bordeaux. He did a lot of work in this area, but uh, we cannot classify that as a, as a clear thermal lens spectrometry or microscopy. 
So here you can see uh, the, the paper that I was referring to. It was done by the group of, of uh, Kitamori in Japan, who was basically the, the pioneer in, in thermal lens microscopy. And here we can see a single, single cell uh, cultured in a, in a microchip. Uh, this is a uh, classical uh, fluorescence image based on the, of course, staining of, of the material in, in the cell. Um, and here we see the thermal lens scan, two-dimensional thermal lens scan with one micrometer resolution, 30 micrometers in both directions, and we can see quite nicely the cytochrome distribution within the cell that co corresponds very well to the, the fluorescence image. And after the cell apoptosis, of course, the cytochrome C is everywhere in, in this uh, microchip. So this is the presentation of a capability of thermal lens microscopy to do imaging of uh, single cells. Uh, but we will now focus more on to the detection of the fluids inside the cell or other biological fluids. But first, uh, before going there, let's refresh a little bit what we were saying about the Vanguard methods. So detecting a signal which will tell us that something is present in our sample. And uh, now we are going basically from satellite imaging down to bioimaging at the cellular level, so to say. Yeah? But what we see from the satellite is actually the algal bloom in the uh, northern sea, or my geography is, back, uh, is bad, but this is part of uh, Great Britain here, so Atlantic. And we can see the algal blooms due to the different phenomena that uh, happen in our environment. Uh, too much uh, nutrients in the water, the change in temperature. But of course, biologists uh, are not interested in, in phenomena as they are seen from the satellite, but they would like to know what is going on here, why this is happening, what, what is the consequence of such phenomena. And uh, a simple way of doing it, which also shows the superior sensitivity of thermal lens spectrometry again, is by looking at the pigments that are present in microorganisms, in the phytoplankton, so to say. When the algal blooms happen, the phytoplankton cells also die, and the contents of the cell is released into the water. And of course, pigments absorb in the visible, and we can very nicely detect them by a sensitive technique such as thermal lens spectrometry. So here we see we have used the, uh, we have caused the decay of the microorganisms by inducing some cytotoxin. This is some, um, uh, what does it say? Oh, addition of poly-APS. Poly-APS is the cyto cytotoxin that comes from sea spongy, and it causes the, uh, breaking apart of the cellular wall. So the pigments, in this case, particularly carotenoids, are released, and we can observe very nicely an increase in thermal lens signal, while spectrophotometry gave us actually no response because of insufficient sensitivity. So this is a, a vanguard method which detects carotenoids or pigments in general and doesn't tell us more about the process. But if we are interested in the beginning of such a process, this is a good technique because we can use it to, to observe that something is changing in this, in this water. After we see this, then we can use, as we described yesterday, the retroguard methods to look more in detail what is going on. Here we see the, uh, uh, another variation of a thermal lens spectrometer which is uh, interesting uh, for the fact that we ha actually have two thermal lens spectrometers. Here we use a, uh, we use a prism to split the two beams, and we have one system here, and the other one is here. Why do we need this? Because we need to control 
with the control population of micro, mar, microorganisms what is going on, because this is a growing, it's, it's a, a living sample, so we must have a reference. And basically what I want to point out is that we can construct two thermal lens spectrometers by using only one, one excitation laser. Okay, uh, now what are the species in, in such? You see here we, we have only uh, mainly diatoms, very nice organisms. And what biologists like to do is not to use a microscope to identify them, but they like to use chemistry. And uh, what they call this is the chemotaxonomy, because each species has a characteristic fingerprint of pigments. And these, these are both carotenoids, fucoxanthin and diadenoxanthin, and they have a, a dual function. They also transform one into, the organism transforms one into the other. One is used to harvest the solar energy. The other one is used to protect the organism against solar light when there is too much light. So during the daily cycle and night cycle, the ratio of these two changes a lot. But first of all, if in, a, in a such a chromatogram, a biologist would see fucoxanthin and the adenoxanthin, they would say, okay, this is, we have diatoms here. And here we have two diatom species. One is Skeletonema costatum, and the other one is Feodactylum tricornutum. I'm bad in Latin, but here you see this is Feodactylum criordotum. Uh, and Skeletonema costatum looks, looks like this. So by looking at the chemical composition of pigments, you can predict which of the species you have in there. But still, you see, between these two, you cannot distinguish. So we were thinking, why don't we do something? And perhaps we will have a, a clue how to distinguish between diatoms, in between diatoms. So to do this, we have to be able to analyze a broad spectrum of different pigments. I will not go into, into many, into, into identification of them. Here you can recognize something that we described already yesterday. Alpha carotene, beta carotene, lycopene here. What you can also observe is the increase in the baseline. This is not the drift in the signal, but the reason is change in thermo-optical properties. What we use here to get all these pigments out of our chromatographic system in a reasonable time, still this is a very long time, yeah? not something we like, but for such systems it's acceptable. To get all these pigments that are highly retained on the column washed out, we are applying a, what we call a gradient elution. So the gradient is in the fact that the mobile phase contains more and more organic solvent when we go towards the end of the chromatogram. And organic solvents means better thermo-optical properties, higher signal, yeah? This is what we have seen yesterday by the enhancement factors, yeah? So this is not a drift. This is actually the change in the composition of our solvents. So you see, we are able to separate a lot of such pigments. Now, the problem, uh, that arises in gradient elution, and we will see this later on in some other applications, the problem is the signal noise. The mixing of two solvents generates inhomogeneity in our eluent in terms of thermal conductivity and dn over dt. And this mixing, which is not complete, causes increase in the signal noise which, as you can see here, with the gradient going from eluent A to eluent B with higher degree of organic phase, we have the highest noise here at the, at the end of the gradient. And then, with time, this decreases again. So here, in a part of chromatogram, we have a, a very significantly deteriorated uh, limits of detection, so to say. And this doesn't change even if we change the rate of the gradient. You see here the two, two similar, uh, actually the same flow rates, but one gradient is faster than the other. 
Uh, it even seems that the faster gradient works a little bit better. Here uh, we have a slower gradient, but the noise is more or less the same. So this uh, is a drawback. That's why we prefer what we call isocratic elution in chromatography with the constant composition of the eluent. But there are ways of improving it, and particularly we can improve it by using longer separation columns. These are packed columns. Longer column means better mixing of the solvents, so less, less noise. And here you can see on the longer column, this is the ratio between the uh, spectrophotometric detection to thermal lens, LOD. This, the lower the uh, uh, thermal lens LOD, the higher is this ratio. So we can see that in the part of the chromatogram, when we apply the gradient, the, this ratio is the lowest. But then it reaches, again, relatively high values, about 20 times improvement for the most sensitive detection of carotenoids with thermal lens spectrometry. When we go to shorter, to shorter columns, of course, the LOD of thermal lens increases. That's why this ratio is lower, but still showing uh, deterioration in the part of the applied gradient. This also reflects in the limits of detection uh, for different carotenoids or different pigments here, even chlorophyll. Uh, gradient is always worse than isocratic. Of course, with isocratic, we cannot separate all. Why the chlorophyll is much, much higher LOD? What's wrong with chlorophyll? Excuse me? It's fluorescing, yeah? So the heat yield with chlorophyll is much, much lower. Chlorophyll is known as highly fluorescing pigment, so we are losing energy, that's why. So chlorophyll, it's better to detect it with, with fluorescence. And uh, uh, still, despite the problems with the gradient, you, here is the chromatogram detected with the diode array detector, you see very low signal to noise ratio and very noisy and unstable baseline. So this shows the advantages of using thermal lens spectrometry despite the problem, despite the problems with the, with the gradient illusion. Now, this is again the same chromatogram on which I have marked different sections, A, B, C, which show completely flat with the, with the diode array detection. Now we will look, what do we see with thermal lens detection? Here, for comparison, is the signal from the UVVs, diode array detector on the bottom. Again, both species, Skeletonema and Feodactylum. But in all the three areas, we can see additional pigments, which are not present in the original chromatogram because of insufficient sensitivity. Yeah? So you see several pigments appearing and we can say that several of them are characteristic for one or the other species. So based on the analysis of what we call minor and trace carotenoids in diatoms, we can, in principle, distinguish between Prodactylum skeletonema, which according to the known chemotaxonomy cannot be distinguished because of insufficient detection system. Okay, from here on, now it's up to biologists to apply this and to demonstrate that this is useful. Uh, we will now go on to the uh, biomolecules in body fluids and also in intracellular solutions. One of such interesting uh, yeah, one of such interesting molecules is um, bilirubin. Bilirubin is one of the endogenous antioxidants in our body, which is, trans is formed from the hemoglobin. The porphyrin ring of the hemoglobin breaks, and this then forms bilirubin. Bilirubin is, as I said, endogenous antioxidant, but is also neurotoxic compound, and especially with, with newborns, 
who have this Junis effect, or I don't know exactly how the medical doctors call it, but the, they become yellow, yeah? And this is because of, of bilirubin, uh, so they have to be treated usually with photo, photo degradation of bilirubin and uh, other treatments to prevent uh, damage of, of the neural system. Uh, therefore, it is very important to understand the behavior of bilirubin in our body. And our colleagues here from University of Trieste were interested in the transport of bilirubin in across the cellular membrane. And we have done some, uh, the problem of course is detecting free bilirubin. So until this work, all the, all the experiments were done on the model molecules, which cannot be exactly uh, considered the same as bilirubin. Uh, the problem is that the solubility of bilirubin is on the order of 50 to 100 nanomolar. And this cannot be detected by spectrophotometry. With thermal lens, we have pushed the limit of detection in this system below one nanomolar. So we were actually able to monitor the process in the real physiological situation. And we can see that uh, the concentration of bilirubin in the substrate did not change very much if the ratio of NADH to NAD plus was low. This is a normal situation in the, in, the, in the cell. And there was no transport in, into the cell because there was no decrease in the bilirubin concentration. But when we have stressed the cells with either high lactate content, and this is an interesting observation. When we work hard, we work physically, we produce lactate. So, and uh, during the work, also radicals are produced. So our body, interestingly, opens the channel to transport bilirubin into the cell to, to protect it. Supposedly, this was our explanation. But also, uh, drinking alcohol, so be careful. Drinking alcohol also causes radicals, but our, our uh, body has a system. It increases the intake of bilirubin. This is in, in both cases. Now, when we have used, oh, sorry. Uh, when we have used a specific antibody which blocked the active site of the Billy translocase, Billy translocase is the protein in the cellular membrane that actually carries bilirubin from the outside to the inside of the cell. And we have shown when this active site, which was known before, was blocked, there was no transport of bilirubin into the, into the cell. So this confirmed, for the first time, the active transport mechanism. The mechanism is active. It needs a protein that takes the substrate and brings it into the cell. It's not like uh, different ions that go through ion channels. Uh, this is, this is non-active transport across the cellular membrane. So this was one of the first interesting works in this uh, respect, and uh, we have continued. Uh, oh, this is an, an extra slide, which will not hurt. Uh, but what I want to show is that we have, we have improved the detection system by coupling. In the previous, uh, previous cases, this was just the model solution. We have a, a physiological solution in which the cells were grown, and we have just added the bilirubin, so there was no question of selectivity or possible interferences. Now, uh, we, we were interested in the levels of free bilirubin in the, in the blood serum, which for, for human blood was not reported yet. And there, of course, we have to separate bilirubin from all the other possibly absorbing compounds in our blood serum. So we have performed HPLC separation, and here you can see the bilirubin, the peak corresponding to bilirubin, and this is uh, diode array detection. You see the big difference in the, in the signal to noise ratio. What is also interesting is that in the standard sample, we, this is a synthetic standard of bilirubin, we can see three different uh, 
uh, isomers of bilirubin. And uh, this clearly confirms that there is no cheating here because in nature, only one isomer is always synthesized. Our body doesn't synthesize three different isomers, which cannot be avoided when you do this chemically. So this is clearly standard because it has three isomers. Our sample contains only the pure, pure peak. And secondly, with this very sensitive method, we are able to monitor degradation products. Bilirubin is very sensitive to light and also to other uh, oxi oxidative species. So when we see some degradation products, here we know that the sample preparation was not performed as, as it should be. You, you can see extremely low limits of detection. And uh, with this, we have, for the first time, determined the free bilirubin in, in the blood serum for three volunteers here. And uh, it's close to some animal samples that were analyzed before. Uh, remember the values here, because we will come to another important discovery. But first of all, uh, I would like to show you another application, which is basically the termination of bilirubin and its counterpart, biliverdine, because bilirubin is transformed through biliverdine and by biliverdine reductase back to bilirubin. So this is an important cycle in a human body to understand the uh, antioxidative potential uh, or activity of our cells. So uh, now, again, we are coming, uh, we are facing the problem of the gradient elution. We are changing the methanol content in our mobile phase from 67 to 97%. Of course, again, we see the increase in the thermal lens signal, the baseline, and here a big, big noise which, of course, doesn't hurt because we are interested in biliverdine, which is eluted here. Then we have this noisy part of the chromatogram, and then at the end, we get elution of, of a bilirubin. These are the concentrations, so you see that we can work well below the levels uh, in um, normal cells. So we can do both pigments at the same time. And finally, uh, this is what I consider the, the, the most important contribution of thermal lens spectrometry to scientific discoveries. Uh, most of the people were mainly reporting extremely high limits of detection. They have shown some applications, but it was never put into the routine, routine analysis or applied for, for some important scientific work. In this case, uh, we have actually confirmed that bilirubin does not exist only in the blood plasma, but also in the endothelial cells, vascular endothelial cells. These are cells that are in, in the inner walls of our veins, and they also represent about 60% of our heart. 60% of our heart is endothelial cells. So it's very important that we have antioxidants to prevent different vascular diseases, which are among the most important diseases of, of, of humankind, I would say. So here again, you can see the demonstration of uh, standard in the red and free bilirubin in our sample, confirmed by UAV spectrometry, also mass spectrometry, if you want to publish something, you, must al you always need to do mass spectrometry. Now you will ask me why you bother with thermal lens if you can do mass spectrometry. With mass spectrometry, you can also analyze the peaks which uh, you know they exist. So before using thermal lens spectrometry and analyzes endothelial vascular cells, there was no indication at all that bilirubin exists in there. And of course, once you know, and you know the chromatographic condition, you can collect sufficiently large fractions to do mass spectrometry, because mass spectrometry you can hardly do on 10 microliters of non-concentrated sample. Yeah? So this 
the molecular peak and the fragmentation, which is also supported by the fragmentation of bilirubin standard, confirms that the bilirubin is present in endothelial cells. And even more, we were able to show that we can modulate, we can increase the concentration of bilirubin by either activating hem oxygenase. Hem oxygenase will transform uh, hemoglobin partly into bilirubin or by adding additional bilirubin. So in both cases, the levels of bilirubin in endothelial cells were increased compared to the control. And what we can see here from the plot, which shows the cellular uh, antioxidant activity units, the uh, EC concentration 50, the effective concentration 50, is about 10 nanomolar. And this is what we have measured in the, the three volunteers that, if you recall, that I have shown for the first measurements in the, in the blood, blood plasma. So this, this corresponds very well and shows that uh, it gives, gives additional uh, credibility to the results. And uh, if you want to read more, this is the, this is the reference. Okay, uh, now I will finish with uh, applications of thermal lens spectrometry in uh, liquid chromatography, so to say. And the ultimate um, result in this is the so-called uh, liquid chromatography in the extended nanospace. Um, in October of last year, this was still without the numbers was published online. Probably now this is, you can get the full reference. Uh, what is the extended nanospace? Uh, we have nanospace in two, we have nanoscale in two dimensions. X, Y, you see that this is uh, 910 nanometers wide microchannel and 220 nanometers deep and it extends over one millimeter in distance. That's why this is not, not uh, entirely considered as a nanospace, but extended nanospace. Uh, what is the advantage here? Uh, we can do separation of molecules, and this was done by using amino acids. Amino acids actually, why amino acids and thermal lens spectrometry? You can find a lot of papers on detection of amino acids because about 30 years ago, or even more, there was a big, big quest for the human genome. Yeah? So the amino acid sequencing and detection of amino acids was very important. That's why thermal lens spectrometry was considered as one of potential techniques to detect amino acids at, at the very low level. And since then, uh, this is used quite a lot as a, as a model, model system. So here we have this. Um, chromatographic system which requires very high pressure pumps and uh, these are the nano channels shown on this microchip. Basically uh, by controlling the flows we can control the injection so sending our sample in this direction and stopping the flow and then starting the flow in this direction will inject this part of the sample into the separation channel. And of course, we need a very, very sensitive detection technique because we are talking about 220 nanometers optical interaction length. Now, thermal lens spectrometry cannot be so sensitive. So we have to, they had to invent a variation of thermal lens spectrometry. Uh, this is what we call a thermal lens microscope, but it has a beam splitter that separates the probe beam into two branches, and only one branch is excited by the excitation beam. Um, measure, measuring or observing the phase shift in the signal, which would result in the defocusing of the probe beam in, in such a short distance is not possible. That's why uh, the signal arises from the interference, because Due to the photothermal effect, there is a phase shift in this signal, in this beam, 
or the branch of this beam, which is later on combined with the un unperturbed probe beam. And from this combination, we can observe an in interference pattern, which is the measure of the absorption at this point. And this is how then you get signals for different amino acids. And look at the time scale here. You see, in 25 seconds, not 1,200 seconds, as we have seen before for carotenoids yeah, in diatoms. Here, in, in 20 seconds, you can separate um, different amino acids and detect them at uh, relatively low concentrations, 10 to 100 ppb, or actually 370 molecules in about 350 nanometer deep microchannels. So this was done in a different, different system. So this would conclude now the, the, the combination of thermal lens spectrometry in liquid chromatography, which uh, we can give interesting and important results, but we could not really call it a, a vanguard a, approach. Uh, now I will, I will return to this fast screening van, vanguard techniques, and one of the first applications that we have done was determination of uh, pesticides, organophosphorus pesticides in different food samples. And what we know about organophosphorus pesticides is that, that they are inhibitors of acetylcholinesterase, which is in every living organism. It's responsible for proper nerve um, functioning or transmission of, of signals through the nervous system of different living organisms. Um, so in, in principle, Organophosphorus pesticides act as a mild nerve uh, agents. Where we have nerve gases, yeah, used in uh, for military purposes. This is a milder variety of, of those, but they act in a similar way. They inhibit the acetylcholinesterase. Now, to have this system faster, we have immobilized acetylcholinesterase in such a column, and by a flowing system, we inject a sample, larger volume of a sample through one valve. This interacts or inhibits, binds irreversibly to acetylcholinesterase, and by injecting the substrate for acetyl, uh, acetylcholinesterase, we can obtain the initial activity of acetylcholinesterase as shown here, and the remaining activity. And the difference here shows the inhibition. So the higher inhibition, the higher the content of, of pesticides in, in, uh, in the sample. This was some sample of onions treated with pesticide, and the other one was iceberg lettuce. We, we can see clearly the decrease in the activity, which confirms the presence of pesticides. Now, uh, why do we want to do this? because we are not interested in looking at a particular pesticide. This would take too much time. Yeah? We cannot analyze every single pesticide present, but we are just interested, is there a pesticide or not? And once we see that there is a pesticide, we can then apply, as we said yesterday, the rear guard methods, HPLC, liquid chromatography, MS, you know, which takes at least three hours for sample preparation and so on and so on. So a very, very time consuming and costly analytical techniques. But this, is, this has shown as a very reliable yes, no response uh, to analyze uh, different food samples. Uh, from here on, we have inverted the philosophy a little bit or try to, to do other applications if we can detect the activity of acetylcholinesterase and the effect of organophosphorus pesticides, we can also detect the activity of cholinesterase in, in body fluids, particularly blood plasma, uh, because acetylcholinesterase is known to be an indicator of our liver function, but lately it's also associated or considered a potential biomarker of Alzheimer's disease, because Acetylcholinesterase regulates the nerves, ner nerve, signals, nerve signals in our body. Yeah? 
So if we are able to, to measure in a very fast way activity of acetylcholinesterase in uh, blood plasma, we could have a good method for diagnosis. So we have tried. And basically, uh, we, instead of using the column with immobilized acetylcholinesterase, we have simply put the substrate for acetylcholinesterase into the carrier buffer. Here we have a pump which carries this buffer to the thermal lens detection cell. And with the injector, we are injecting about 20 microliters, in this case, of a sample to which we have added a reagent. This reagent, DTNB, reacts with the product of reaction between the acetylcholinesterase, which is contained in this sample, and the substrate. So acetylcholinesterase plus substrate gives a compound A that reacts with DTNB and produces this yellow-colored compound B, so to say, to make it simple for you. Yeah? So, this is an online reaction, and you see here we get very nice peaks which correspond to the activity of acetylcholinesterase. We can, we can calibrate this by knowing the concentration. This is a calibration curve, basically. Um, so one times diluted means 164 units of acetylcholinesterase per milliliter of solution. Here we were able to dilute it 10,000 times, and we still see the signal, which at present corresponds closely to the limit of detection, which is about, let's say, 10 milliunits per milliliter. The blood levels in human plasma from different studies were at the level between 2 to 8 units per milliliter. So we are about 500 times, 1,000 times, no, 1,000 times and even more lower than that. So we can detect in a very sensitive way. And what is most important, we can do this in a very short time. Uh, here you can see we still have some, no. Still have some margin. You see, my, my student was uh, probably drinking coffee in between two injections. But in principle, this is about 300 seconds. We could do three injections in about, in about two minutes' time very easily. So two minutes for one analysis. If you, if you take a commercial assay from APCAM, this is between 10 to 30 minutes at least. So we can go much, much faster and providing also higher, higher sensitivity. So this is one of the starting points for our fu future work in this regard. Uh, another combination with bioanalytical methods, now we, now we have to go back to yesterday's lecture and remember why do we need bioanalytical methods with thermal lens spectrometry? Why did we need acetylcholinesterase? One of the problems is selectivity. The other one is limited excitation wavelengths. Yeah? With acetylcholinesterase, we have converted, so to say, our pesticide, which does not absorb in the visible, into something measurable in the visible spectral range. Here, we are after food allergens. If you go now to the restaurant, you see all kinds of different markings, labels by different food uh, offers, yeah, even pizza, gluten, uh, beta-lactoglobulin, ovalbumin, all these are aller allergens. Uh, then uh, proteins coming from peanuts and so on. Uh, so we want to detect them. You know, uh, producing uh, allergen food free is very important. Such food is very expensive. That's why very easily people are trying to cheat on this. So you must have reliable methods to determine. Now, uh, of course, we cannot detect food allergens as such. So we have to use other techniques, other methods, and in this case is, is so-called ELISA test. And I will just briefly explain what is the secret of this test. We use um, what we call a primary antibodies, which are 
immobilized to some solid surface, and these primary antibodies bind selectively to antigen, as it's shown here, which is actually our analyte. This would be the, uh, the food allergen in this case. Now, of course, food allergens can also bind to the support. So after the first step, we have to block all the active sites by adding uh, some proteins. These are these yellow dots here that block other active sites, so the binding is possible only to the active sites of the primary antibody. Then we use secondary antibody, which again binds specifically only to this particular antigen. Yeah? So we have secondary antibodies for every particular allergen. We have antibody for beta-lactoglobulin, antibody for ovalbumin, and so on. Yeah? And this secondary antibody is then labeled, usually with some enzyme. It can also be labeled with the fluorophore. Yeah? Now, using horse reddish peroxidase as a label, then we need a substrate which is converted by the action of this enzyme, and this forms a colored product, which is then detected either spectrophotometrically or by thermal lens spectrometry. Now, consider all these steps here, and the fact that proteins are large molecules, so they have very, uh, um, very low diffusion constant Diffusion constant. So it takes a lot, a lot of time for a, such a protein to diffuse to the active site if we have a relatively large sample or large distances. Uh, this makes such analysis very, very long. Sometimes it requires even 24 hours to be completed, the entire sequence. Now here, for the same system, where we have used a little trick by pre-incubating our sample with the secondary antibodies which were already labeled. Yeah. So we, have, we, we went from this step directly to this one. We have skipped two steps here. So we pre-incubated our sample. The antibodies bind to the allergen, and this allergen then bind to the uh, primary antibody. Uh, so here you can see the, the injection of our sample, which was this part here, and then we were injecting the, uh, the substrate. This is this OPD, and this has resulted in high signals which were proportional to the concentration of our analyte. And you can see that we were able to do it in a re relatively, relatively short time. It doesn't require 24 hours, but this, these tests are usually much, much faster. But what I want to show is much lower limits of detection. Uh, this one is a little bit optimistic. I would trust this here comparison. This is a commercial uh, transmission mode measurement by, by micro titer plate reader. This one, 1,000 times, um, I think, either my student exaggerated a little bit, or the producer was a little bit conservative in specifying this limit of detection. Because this is not what we tested, we just took it as a specification from the producer. Usually, from what we know now, from what the enhancement factors and from the laser powers that we get, you can easily determine that for about 100 milliwatts power, uh, you can expect between one to two orders of magnitude improvement in limit of detection, yeah, compared to, to spectrophotometry. So here, uh, now we are going from the microscopic, this, is, this would be a micro -titer well, yeah, on a micro -titer plate. Usually we have immobilized antibodies, and uh, we put a few millimeters of a solution. If we go to the microfluidic systems, you see, this is now 100 micro, micrometer channel with uh, uh, antibodies immobilized on some microscopic bits or even nanoparticles, as we will see later. Yeah? We significantly reduce the distances, and the molecular diffusion time goes with the square 
of the distance. So going from, let's say, one millimeter to 100 micrometers, we reduce the molecular diffusion time by a factor of 100. And that's why you see assay for uh, immunoglobulin A was reduced from 24 hours to 20 minutes by using such a system with the thermal lens microscopic detection. Why thermal lens microscopic detection? Because we have only 100 micrometers interaction length. And there, in the transmission mode measurement, it is very difficult to get any reasonable signal. Um, okay, in addition to this, we can do all different uh, processes from extraction, uh, as shown here for, for this de determination of cobalt by introducing the ligand that makes uh, uh, makes complexes with cobalt, but also with other, with other metal ions, which are then extracted into this microfluidic system into M-xylene, and then by adding acid, some metal ions are, uh, metal complexes are destroyed. Uh, some are extracted into the, this uh, basic medium, while cobalt complex remains and is detected. Uh, in very impressive limit of detection, considering the, the small detection volume. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, in terms of concentrations, this is not so, so impressive because the interaction lengths are extremely short. We have learned about thermal lens microscope and its operation yesterday, so we will not uh, repeat it today. Uh, here, I would like to go on with another approach in, in detection of non-absorbing species. I mean non-absorbing at the wavelengths of lasers which are available. Yeah? So if you want to make them absorbing, we have to do some colorimetric reactions. And uh, just to demonstrate the principle of this analysis, I will show you the case for the de determination of chromium-6, chromate. This is a cancerogenic species. That's why we don't like it in the, in the drinking water. Another problem is that it's very, very soluble as compared to chromium-3, which is, on the other hand, another species of chromium, but is essential for our body. So we have an essential and we have a highly toxic species. So it's important to determine not the total concentration of chromium, but the, what we call the speciation of chromium. So here we have, uh, okay, uh, here we have a carrier fluid. This is a microfluidic chip. Here you can see our home-built thermal lens microscope with the probe beam coming up, and here is this position of the, of the microchip here. The pump beam comes from the top down, and here we, we, we see the detector. So we have a carrier fluid which runs at 5 to 50 microliters per minute, and then we do a very fast injection at uh, about five times higher in, uh, flow rates of our sample, which contains chromium-6. The carrier contains the sp specific reagent that forms a colored complex with the chromium. This is the one that we have demonstrated yesterday as an example of photosensitive analyte. Yeah? So we don't want to have too much, we don't want to have too much um, laser power or power density. Again, the considerations of the flow which we described yesterday. So we, we have to keep the pump and the probe beam slightly uh, displaced in terms of, of their axis. Okay. Now, here uh, we have a demonstration of different injection volumes. So, and we see that after we go to close to one microliter injection, the, the peaks split. We, have, we get a double peaks. The reason is that this sample inside the microchannel is very, very long. It extends over several centimeters. 
So the, the diffusion time for the reagent to come from front edge and from the rear edge of our sample to the center is too short. Only when we have a shorter sample, which means shorter volume at, of about 0.7 microliters, this reaction is complete at the center. Even this is surprising for such a long distances, but in another work we have shown that not just the molecular diffusion, by, but convective mixing in the microfluidic system is, is a very important way of transporting reagents. So in, in microfluidics we have a lot of convective mixing with, which assists to the, to the speed of those reactions. Uh, then going with the, with the optimal sample size at the different uh, carrier flow rates, you see at the low flow rate we, we have a lot of diffusion again. That's why peaks are much broader. Uh, going with the faster flow rates, we lose a little bit of signal because of the known effect, loss of heat with the flow, yeah. we lose a little bit of signal, but still, the, the diffusion is much less, diffusional broadening is much less, and we can do up to 20 injections in one minute. 20 samples, okay, if we do in duplicate, 10 samples in one minute can be analyzed. So this is now already the question of uh, mechanical engineers, no, no uh, automatic sampler, sampler is so fast as, as we can do it. So we, we don't want to push it further before we, we resolve the question of uh, auto sampler and, and injections. But this shows you how fast we can do uh, such analysis. And now let's go back to the, to the bio. Even though chromium-6 is related to, to, to cancer, so it cannot be excluded from bioanalysis, but I would like to show you an experiment with, uh, uh, again, linking the algal blooms. This is related to cyanobacteria. When cyanobacteria are blooming, there is a lot of dead cyanobacteria which form microcystin. And microcystin is a known neurotoxin. That's why there is a very low uh, regulatory limit for, for drinking and recreational waters and the big interest of fast screening techniques to detect microcystin, which is this uh, macromolecule. The interesting property or important property of microcystin is that it inhibits the phosphatase enzyme. And so, similarly to the acetylcholinesterase case, we can observe the activity of phosphatase by the conversion of this pia, uh, para nitrophenyl phosphate into paranitrophenol, which is uh, then in equilibrium with paranitrophenolate, which is colored species that we can detect. So we are, uh, we have a carrier flow with our reagent and we are injecting our sample as we have done with the, with the chromium-6 in the previous case. And Further down, after this reaction happens, we have a thermal lens microscope that detects the, the product. So the higher the concentration of the product, higher the activity of the enzyme, less microcystin. Lower the activity of the enzyme, lower the signal, higher the concentration of microcystin. And this is the calibration curve that we have done, and uh, we could reach a limit of detection of about 80 nanograms per liter, which is 12 times below the WHO limit for drinking water. What is more important, we can do it eight times faster than batch mode assay due to the shorter distance or due to direct mixing because the um, W uh, or this commercial assay does this on the macroscopic microtiter plate. Uh, another, oh, we still have about 20 minutes. Another important application in biomedical diagnostics, for example, detection of biomarkers of ac acute kidney injury. Uh, where does it come from? And, and the reason why we have undertaken this research, medical doctors, when they do 
imaging of uh, soft tissues, they usually use different contrast agents. And the, one of the MRI contrast agents, it's uh, a group of iodinated uh, benzene, uh, iodinated aromatic compounds, uh, causes such kidney failure. So, of course, uh, medical doctors are interested not only of measuring this biomarker, which is NGAL, this stands for neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin, if it tells you something. It's basically a protein that is released when your kidney is, is uh, under in inflammation process, basically. Uh, not only that they want to, to, to measure the status of your kidney, but they would like to do it during the operation. Because once they have the patient there, they would like to know whether they can do another injection of the contrast agent for imaging, or they better don't do it because the patient is in already bad, bad shape due to the kidney. So in the past, they were using uh, creatinine as the indicator of kidney failure, but creatinine response in about two days' time. So there was no way that they could wait with the patient there, open heart, and do, do the imaging. Um, the commercial kit for Engal takes four hours. So this was the idea. Do it faster than four hours, if we can. And of course, we have tried. This is a co commercial micro titer plate, as you can see it, with different standard solutions and different samples. And this is then read on the what we call the micro titer reader in a transmission mode in this case because there is no fluorescence engaged. Um, we have taken such samples and analyzed with thermal lens spectrometry and you can see that uh, in this microfluidic system we can get a very, very fast uh, response of fast injection of several samples. With, uh, in triplicate, for example, we could analyze two samples in, in one minute. Uh, with still uh, fi 500 times diluted samples uh, with better LODs than in the case of transmission mode. Uh, but this was still a macroscopic uh, uh, system and the reaction took four, four hours, as in the commercial kit. So we want to transfer it into the microfluidic system and for this we use the, the magnetic nanobits. These are magnetic nanobits with, with uh, um, iron oxide core and uh, silica shell that makes them insoluble or inert. And we can immobilize, as it, um, we, we can immobilize the primary antibodies for Engal on such nanobits and we can insert them into the microchannels and keep them there by magnetic field. One of the important uh, obstacles in such systems is filling and replacing the biomolecule once it's either inhibited or used, consumed, degraded. It's quite complicated. If you use magnetic nanobits, you have a microchannel. You trap them with the magnetic field. When the antibodies are used, you remove the magnetic field, flush it out, and new injection of magnetic nanobits again. And here you can see probably a little bit of blue coloration, or here, which is already the, the product of this uh, horse reddish peroxidase label, labeled um, antibodies, secondary antibodies, which were also reacting in this small microchannel in a, in a relatively fast, faster way. Uh, this is now actually the image of, uh, let's say, our prototype. Uh, this is the thermal lens microscope. Here you can see two, two lasers, one for excitation, the other one is probe. Here is the microfluidic chip with represented magnetic field that traps the nanobits. These are the microfluidic pumps. And we have reduced by performing all these steps, all the six steps that I have shown initially for allergens, we have performed all these steps in the microchannel. And by doing this, we have reduced the time of analysis 
of the entire process from four, four hours, which is a commercializer, down to 35 minutes already. So we can, in principle, do analysis on each, on an, with the ha half an hour time resolution, so to say. Um, even better if we take samples at a much shorter intervals. Uh, but what is uh, interesting is that by using this on different patients, which were subject to the, uh, this um, diagnostics, uh, we have also shown the comparison of thermal lens microscopy to ELISA, which gives relatively good, good co correlation. But uh, we have observed a significant increase in N-GAL concentration only in one patient, and this was relatively slow. It's a two-hour time response. So again, showing that N-GAL response, response too slowly to meet the requirements of medical doctors. So we need to find another, another biomarker. Uh, but the, the analytical tools are here. Of course, we can immobilize any available antibody on such a magnetic nanobits. And by having appropriate antibodies, we can then selectively detect different, uh, different uh, biomolecules. One of them could be, for example, viruses. Uh, one such virus is a human papilloma virus, uh, which is uh, particularly known to our female participants because it can cause cervical cancer. And uh, we want to avoid this. So uh, by using what we call pseudovirions, yeah, human papilloma virus pseudovirions can be synthesized basically in laboratory. We, have, we can start with a, a protein which forms uh, such uh, five, five protein structure and uh, this 72 such structures then form non-infectious human papilloma virus. Uh, it has, on the surface, it has all the properties of human papilloma virus, but it's not infectious because it doesn't have any, any content which would be the, the mechanism of inf infection. Yeah. So we can use such uh, pseudovirions, as we call them, immobilize them, and then they, would, they will attract antibodies which can be found in the infected person. Yeah. So the antibody that is formed in our, our body to, to fight this infection would bind to such a pseudovirion in this microfluidic system, and we will be able to detect whether a person was infected or not. Uh, here I am showing some different calibration curves performed on such a system, and here we have a via uh, microscopic flow injection analysis with thermal lens detection on, on magnetic nanobits with the best limit of detection compared to the uh, commercial ELISA or ELISA combined with the thermal lens mi microscopy. So we can do it in a sufficiently sensitive way. And uh, comparison of ELISA and uh, microtiter Microfiat LM with nanobits shows good agreement. And in, in some cases where ELISA does not provide sufficient sensitivity, we're still able to detect, uh, detect the antibodies. And the, the persons that were under this investigation, they were known by the medical doctors that they were infected. So this was no no question, is this true or not? Yes, they were infected. The level of, uh, of uh, these antibodies to human papilloma virus, of course, it de depends on the stage of the infection. So if a person was infected, I don't know, two weeks ago, 
or one year ago, of course, the level of antibodies decreases. Yeah? Uh, also, the magnitude of the infection it, itself. But uh, important to demonstrate always the reliability of the technique. Conclusions, probably we can save some time for questions. But the something that I have, ah, I forgot my glasses, that's first. Uh, but what I wanted to point out is actually the time of analysis, which uh, unfortunately I don't have here. But uh, the, the total time of analysis is again 35 minutes with thermal lens in a microfluidic system. I bet that the commercial ELISA for human papilloma virus is on the order of 10 hours, something like that. So this is the time difference which we can get by performing the steps of the ELISA test in a micro, on micro scale by reducing the distances, which reduces the molecular diffusion time. That's the, the, main, the main secret of this approach. So with this, I think I have exhausted all my slides. And uh, of course, I will be happy to answer any, any question you might have. Hope I will be able to. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so...